On a sunny April afternoon, the school bell rang and kids poured out, excited to head home. Among them was eight-year-old Tori Stafford, her bright smile lighting up as she walked toward her older brother, just like any other day. But as she made her way through the crowd, a woman approached her, someone who seemed friendly and safe. After a quick chat, Tori took the woman's hand, trusting her without a second thought, and walked over to a nearby car. In that small, ordinary moment, everything changed. The town of Woodstock, Ontario, was about to be shaken by a mystery that would turn Tori's world upside down. Her family and friends couldn't have imagined what was really happening that day, or the dark truths that would slowly come to light. Victoria Stafford, more commonly known as Tory Stafford, was born on July 15, 2000, in the town of Woodstock, Canada. She was the second child in her family, born to Rodney Stafford and Tara McDonald, who had previously welcomed their first child, a boy named Darren Stafford. Tory's family life was marked by significant difficulties largely due to the complex and troubled relationship between her parents. This tension led to their separation in 2002. It was reported that both Rodney and Tara struggled with substance abuse, but while Rodney managed to enroll in a detox program, Tara did not follow the same path. Following the separation, Tori and her brother Darren stayed with their mother. Despite the less-than-ideal circumstances of her home life, Tori was a vibrant and affectionate little girl, known for her warm smile, sparkling eyes, and chestnut hair. She enjoyed the simple joys of childhood, like playing with her friends and attending school. She also loved going to the movies and watching performances related to ballet, dance, and acting. Tori's compassion extended to animals, with a particular love for dogs. She frequently begged her mother for a puppy, and although Tara's financial situation was tight, she was actively trying to find a way to bring a dog into their lives that would suit a home with two young children. By the time Tori turned eight, she was attending a public school in her town. On April 8, 2009, Tori set off for school around 7.45 in the morning, as she usually did accompanied by her brother Darren. They planned to meet after classes to walk home together, a habit they shared regularly. The siblings were deeply bonded, and their strong relationship helped them cope with their challenging family situation. Though Tori was lively and outgoing, Darren was more reserved. She often encouraged him to enjoy typical childhood activities, helping him stave off the sadness that their circumstances occasionally brought. As the school day ended around 3.30 p.m., Darren waited outside the school building for Tori, intending to go home with her. However, his friends asked him to join them briefly, and he agreed, assuming it would only take a few minutes. When he returned to their usual meeting spot, he found that Tori was gone. Thinking she might have decided to go home alone, he headed back, only to discover she wasn't there. Worried, he told Tara, who tried to reassure him, suggesting that Tori was likely with her friends. But Darren remained unsettled. He quickly took his bicycle and began searching the neighborhood, checking with neighbors and searching nearby streets. While Darren was searching, Tara decided to call her mother to ask if Tori was with her but she wasn't. 
Growing concerned, Tori's grandmother contacted the police around 6 p.m., reporting her granddaughter's absence. Officers arrived promptly at Tara's home and started asking questions, noting Tara's delayed reaction to alerting the authorities, which they found unusual. Learning of Tara's struggles with substance abuse and her unemployment, investigators placed her high on the list of individuals potentially involved in Tori's disappearance. Meanwhile, the search for Tori intensified. News of her absence quickly reached Rodney, who immediately joined the efforts to locate his daughter. The community rallied, with neighbors and friends helping to distribute posters of Tori across the area. The school even closed temporarily to allow teachers and staff to join the search. Posters featuring Tori's face appeared on almost every corner, and search parties combed through Woodstock, asking anyone they encountered if they had seen her. Despite the widespread effort, no clues emerged as to her whereabouts. Determined to uncover any leads, investigators decided to check the footage from security cameras located around the school. To their surprise, they found clear footage of Tori leaving the school at 3.30 p.m. She was seen talking to a woman and showed no signs of fear or hesitation, suggesting familiarity. The woman took Tori's hand and together they walked toward a vehicle parked nearby. The police immediately released this footage to local media in hopes of identifying the woman who appeared to have physical similarities to Tara. Rodney, visibly shaken, appeared in interviews on multiple media outlets, showing deep concern for his daughter's safety, a demeanor that sharply contrasted with Tara's stoic response. The public quickly noticed this contrast, with many expressing suspicion toward Tara. In response to mounting criticism, she agreed to an interview, during which she expressed sadness and frustration, stating that people were focusing on baseless rumors instead of the search for Tory. Rodney, despite their differences, supported Tara's statement, emphasizing their shared hope for Tory's safe return. As the footage circulated, the public became more involved in the search, while Tara viewed the clips multiple times, feeling a strange familiarity with the woman. Finally, on April 12, 2009, Tara contacted the police, claiming she had recognized the woman from the footage. According to her, the woman was Terry Lynn McClintock, an 18-year-old who had once been her neighbor. Whether Tara genuinely recognized her or received information from others in her circle remains unclear, but her identification proved to be a significant breakthrough in the case. Terry Lynn McClintock, a troubled young woman with a complex past, had crossed paths with Tara, Tori Stafford's mother, on multiple occasions. According to some accounts, she occasionally procured oxycodone for Tara, and in a few instances the two had brief conversations about raising dogs, with Tara sharing how Tori longed to have one as a pet. Although Tara confirmed that there was no close relationship between her and Terry Lynn, she acknowledged that Terry was aware of Tori's strong desire to have a dog. Terry Lynn's childhood was marred by hardship, shaped by parental neglect and abuse. She was ultimately raised by her adoptive mother, who worked in local nightclubs. These early life challenges deeply affected Terry Lynn, and by adolescence, she exhibited violent behaviors, engaging in various altercations, including an attack on her adoptive mother and some local youths. In 2007, she escalated her criminal behavior by committing an armed robbery, injuring a man who resisted. Following this incident, Terry Lynn was detained at a juvenile center, where she reportedly wrote disturbing letters expressing her desire to inflict pain and suffering on others. Though her psychological issues were noted at the time, she was eventually released back into the community. With this background, law enforcement swiftly brought Terry Lynn in for questioning when they identified her as a suspect in Tory's disappearance. 
Despite extensive interrogations, Terry Lynn insisted on her innocence. By April 13th, the local police handed over the missing person investigation to the Ontario Provincial Police, officially reclassifying it as a kidnapping case. Determined to uncover the truth, the new investigative team monitored Terry Lynn's calls and visits closely, soon noticing her frequent interactions with Michael Rafferty, a 28-year-old man she claimed as her boyfriend. Michael, however, described their relationship as strictly platonic, though he regularly visited her. Born on December 28, 1980 in Woodstock, Ontario, Michael also came from a troubled family background. By 2009, he exhibited aggressive tendencies and had been accused by at least 13 women of physical violence during intimate encounters, often involving attempts to choke them. Continuing their probe, police decided to question Michael during one of his visits to Terry Lynn, framing their inquiries around her recent activities on the day of Tory's disappearance. Unfortunately, they couldn't gather enough evidence to hold him, so they returned their focus to Terry Lynn, increasing the frequency and intensity of their interrogations. Despite mounting pressure, she remained tight-lipped, leading investigators to a standstill. On April 25, 2009, an international television program aired a special segment on Tory's disappearance, drawing significant public attention. To everyone's surprise, the broadcast struck an emotional chord with Terry Lynn, who, five days later on April 30th, broke down and confessed that Tory had died on the same day she was taken. Terry Lynn recounted the grim events, providing chilling details of the crime. She explained that on the morning of April 8th, she and Michael were using substances together when he suggested taking a young girl against her will. He specified that the victim should be a child and goaded Terry Lynn, knowing her vulnerabilities, by challenging her courage and hinting she lacked the nerve. Eager to prove him wrong, Terry Lynn went along with the plan. At around 3.15 p.m., they drove to a school nearby and parked at the back. She got out and waited, watching children as they exited until she spotted Tori. Utilizing the information Tara had shared in their conversations, she approached Tori, introducing herself as a friend of her mother and promising that she had a puppy in her car. Innocent and eager to meet the supposed puppy, Tori trusted her, held her hand, and walked with her to the car, where Michael grabbed Tori and forced her into the vehicle. The pair then drove about 80 miles north, keeping the radio on to monitor for news of Tori's disappearance. Confident they hadn't been detected, they made a couple of stops along the way, first at a gas station and then at a department store. Here, Terry Lynn left Michael with Tori and went inside to buy a hammer, garbage bags, and tape. Afterward, they continued driving to a remote field where Terry Lynn stepped out of the car knowing what Michael intended to do. According to her account, she turned her back to avoid witnessing the horrors unfolding. However, as Tori's desperate cries echoed from the car, Terry Lynn briefly glanced back and saw the young girl pleading and crying, reaching out for help. Terry Lynn admitted she knew from the outset what would happen and chose not to intervene, claiming she didn't want to be present for the final moments. This confession not only provided the police with the answers they needed, but also shocked the community, bringing an end to the weeks-long search for Tory Stafford. Back in the car, Michael Rafferty unleashed unimaginable cruelty on Tory Stafford. Afterward, Terry Lynn placed a bag over Tory's head and struck her with a hammer, ending her life. Together, they buried her body at the remote location. On the drive back to town, Michael made Terry Lynn numerous promises that they would always be together and that the police would never catch them. Following Terry Lynn's harrowing confession, 
investigators immediately headed to Michael's residence to place him under arrest. During the journey, they discovered a security camera and obtained permission to review its footage. The video was a crucial piece of evidence, capturing the pair on their way to commit the crime. In subsequent interrogations, police managed to extract information about the location where Tori's body had been hidden. A search led them to a wooded area where they found her remains wrapped in garbage bags and secured with tape. On July 20th, the preliminary autopsy report was released, revealing that Tori had suffered multiple hammer-inflicted injuries, with at least four blows penetrating her skull, resulting in fatal trauma. She also had 16 fractured ribs and liver damage. However, due to the body's advanced state of decomposition, it was impossible to determine if she had been assaulted in other ways. On July 21, 2009, authorities confirmed publicly that the remains found were indeed those of Tori Stafford. This heartbreaking announcement devastated her family and the community, who had come together in hope throughout the search. A funeral was held for Tori on July 30, 2009, attended by family, friends, and community members who gathered to honor her short but impactful life. The ceremony included heartfelt memories shared by loved ones, and the emotional impact of her case resonated deeply within society. Once the police investigation concluded and all evidence was gathered, the legal proceedings against the two accused commenced. Initially, prosecutors considered a joint trial, but eventually decided on separate trials after Terry Lynn pled guilty to first-degree murder. She faced an expedited trial and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 25 years. In contrast, Michael Rafferty maintained his innocence, refusing to testify and claiming no responsibility. As a result, his trial took place three years after Tory's disappearance involving 62 witnesses and more than 200 pieces of evidence. Michael, now 31, did not testify. Although he admitted to some involvement in Tory's abduction, he denied the charges of murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault. The jury, however, found him guilty on all counts. Following the guilty verdict, Michael Rafferty received a life sentence for the murder of Victoria Stafford, also known as Tory Stafford, with parole eligibility only after 25 years. Additionally, he was given 10 years for kidnapping and sexual assault to be served concurrently with his life sentence. Even if he were to be released, the judge permanently prohibited him from owning firearms. He was also required to submit a DNA sample to Canada's National Sex Offender Registry. After his sentencing, Michael continued to protest his innocence and even offered to meet with Tory's mother, Tara, ostensibly to fill in the missing pieces. Tara, however, refused any communication with him, stating she could never forgive him. Despite his repeated legal appeals over the years, all attempts to overturn his conviction have been denied. Tory Stafford's tragic story has left an indelible mark on Canadian society, underscoring the importance of child safety, parental responsibility, and the necessity for prompt police response in critical situations. Thanks for tuning in to Unreal True Crime. If you're intrigued by mysteries from around the world, check out our new channel, Latin Crimes, where we dive into the gripping true crime stories of Latin America. Don't miss out. Subscribe now for more thrilling investigations.